Hey, Shabbat Shalom. Welcome everyone to the study of Torah this afternoon. Uh, we continue in the book of Leviticus, and today is the Torah portion called Emor, Emor, which can be translated as speak or say, and it's found in Leviticus chapter 21, verse 1 through chapter 24, verse 23. But before we start, I would like to say the blessing for the Torah portion. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech HaOlam, asher kitshanu bemitzvotah vetzivanu laasok bedivrei Torah. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who sanctifies us with your commandments and commanded us to engage ourselves in the words of the Torah. Amen, amen, amen. So today we continue, like I was saying, with the protocol of holiness and this time when we start in chapter 21 the Lord again addresses the instructions to the priesthood because remember that last week we were talking about ritual impurity and remember that ritual impurity has to do with you can become ritually impure in reference to the temple, in reference to the ceremonies, in reference to the services done in the temple. There's two types of impurities. There's this ritual impurity, and then there's the moral impurity. For the ritual impurity, there were offerings, there were services that could be done so that we could come back to a state of purity, which meant that we can go into the Mishkan or the tabernacle and that we could go into the temple. Because all these laws, all these regulations of holiness are in reference to the sacred space, which is either the Mishkan or the temple. So now in, these, in this chapter, the Lord starts addressing again the priesthood, going into more details about things that have to do with the grade of holiness of the priest. So in chapter 21 of Leviticus, verse 1 says, and the Lord said to Moses, Speak to the priests, the sons of Aaron, and say to them, None shall defile himself for the dead among his people. In other words, they cannot come close to a dead person because that is going to cause ritual impurity. Remember that a corpse, death, is the thing that causes most impurity. Verse 2 except for his relatives who are nearest to him, his mother, his father, his son, his daughter, and his brother. And even though it doesn't mention it here, it's assumed that also his wife. Verse 3, also his virgin sister who is near to him, who has had no husband for, he, for her, he may defile himself. When it says defile, it means that he can become ritually impure, that he can become ritually unclean, for only these relatives if they die. Okay. Now this is speaking about the priesthood in general. The one that is not the high priest. Because for the high priest there's going to be even more strict limitations and restrictions. Because of the grade of holiness that the high priest has. Verse 4. Otherwise he shall not defile himself being a chief man among his people. To profane himself. Remember the term profane? Can either be unclean or impure. Profane means common. Something that is not holy. Okay, so again, he cannot make himself impure or defile himself or unclean for death unless it's a close relative. Verse 5. They shall not make any bolts place on their heads, nor shall they shave the edges of their beards, nor make any cuttings in their flesh. Now, this is in relationship to mourning. Mourning. Because remember, it's talking about death of family. These were customs or rituals related by the cultures around Israel that had to do with uh, symbols of mourning for a, a dead relative or a dead person. So the Lord says, you're not going to have do these things because you are not to mourn the same way the other cultures mourn because this is not what the priests are supposed to do. Verse 6. They shall be holy to their God and not profane the name of their God, for they offer the offerings of the Lord made by fire and the bread of their God. Therefore, they shall be holy. 
In other words, is the priest who brings the offerings to the altar. That is also understood as the food of God or the bread of God. It is not that God eats any of these things, but is the things that are offered to him, the people offer them, but the priests are the ones that partake of it. They're the ones that put these offerings on the altar. So therefore, because they come to a place that is most more holy within the temple complex, because you have to remember there's different grades of holiness. The further away you are from the temple, say you're on the mountain and you're coming in through the, through the first set of gates to the temple, that is holy. But as you get closer, like for example, you go to the court of the women, that's holier than the outside wall. And then from the court of the women, when you go into what's called the court of Israel, that is even more holy than the court of the women. So the way the temple is put is is built on the mountain. The mountain itself teaches you that as, as you go from the furthest gate that's on the mountain towards the temple, you go in an incline. You keep going higher and higher and higher. So therefore, as you get closer to the sanctuary itself, which is basically where the altar is, and the holy place and the holy of holies, that area is even more holy. So therefore, there's more restrictions. Only in that area, the priest can minister. And we know like the high priest, the high priest is the only priest that can go into the holy of holies because it's the most holy place, is the closest to God because it's, it represents his throne. And so the high priest is the one that has the greatest grade of holiness among all the people of Israel. That's why he says that they must be holy to their God and not profane the name of the Lord because anything that meant that they were ritually unclean or ritually impure, basically they're profaning, making unholy the name of the Lord also because they represent the Lord. As they minister to the people, they're representing the Lord. So if they're in a state of ritual impurity, and they try to go in and do the things that the Lord says, you can't handle these things because you're in a state of ritual impurity, and they still do it, what they're doing basically is defiling the name of the Lord. Verse 7, they shall not take a wife who is a harlot or a defiled woman, nor shall they take a woman divorced from her husband, for the priest is holy to his God. So even in matrimony, there's restrictions. Why? Because of the grade of holiness that the priesthood has. Verse 8, Therefore you shall consecrate him, for he offers the bread of your God. He shall be holy to you, for I, the Lord, who sanctify you, am holy. We need to understand that this holiness, this sanctification, this kedusha, is something that the Lord imparts to the people. It's not anything that we do by ourselves is something that in obedience to his commandments to his protocols is that we acquire holiness through god okay verse 9 the daughter of any priest if she profanes herself by playing the harlot she profanes her father she shall be burned with fire this is the only commandment that directly says that a person needs to be burned. And it has to do a woman that is a daughter of a priest. And she profanes. In other words, let's say she commits adultery. She, can, she goes into immoral, uh, sexual immorality. She is dishonoring her father. She's dishonoring the name of her household, of her family. Therefore, the punishment is to be burned. Now, of course, we need to understand that there has to be a judgment. This is not just done, okay, I found her doing this, and then she's killed. No, there has to be a court. There has to be a ruling. There has to be a judgment, and this is brought before the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin. Now we have the restrictions for the high priest in verse 10. It says, he who is the high priest among his brethren, in other words, among the other priests, on whose head the anointing oil was poured and who is consecrated to wear the garments shall not uncover his head nor tear his clothes. Now uncovering his head, here it's understood 
again, mourning. Customs that, ref that reflected that the person is in mourning. One of the things they would do is that they would let their hair grow and leave it uncombed. They would also tear their clothing as a sign of mourning. So the high priest cannot do that. He says, nor shall he go near any dead body, nor defile himself or his father or his mother, nor shall he go out of the sanctuary, nor profane the sanctuary of his God. For the consecration of the anointing oil of his God is upon him. In other words, that oil that was put on his head is like a crown. It's representing the Lord. Therefore, the high priest, if his parents die, if his close relatives die, he cannot go near them. That means he cannot participate at the funeral. He cannot go to the cemetery. Why? Because he would get defiled. He would be, be, be made ritually impure. So he was not allowed to do that. Why? Nor go out of the sanctuary to the funeral or to the cemetery because of the impurity, ritual impurity that would come upon him because of the death of this relative. So different from the rest of the priests, which could go to the funerals and the cemetery for their closest relatives, the high priest could not do that because he is the person that has the greatest holiness in terms of service unto the Lord. Verse 13, and he shall take a wife in her virginity. He could only marry a virgin. He could not marry a divorced woman, a widow, any other woman. He had to be a virgin. He says, a widow or divorced woman or defiled woman or a harlot, these he shall not marry, but he shall take a virgin of his own people as wife. Verse 15, nor shall he profane his posterity among his people. In other words, his descendants, his seed, his children, for I, the Lord, sanctify him. So if he did not marry, he had to marry a virgin because the children that were going to be coming out of that matrimony because of who he is, of the rank, of the status that he has, his children are going to carry also that holiness. Because you have to remember that only the descendants of Aaron can be priests. So he has to marry a woman that is completely virgin, that has never been with another man, so that seed, those children, come out in a state of ritual purity. Now this is only for the high priest. Verse 16, And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron, saying, No man of your descendants in succeeding generations who has any defect may approach to offer the bread of his God. So any descendant of Aaron that's going to, that has a physical defect and is going to name cannot, when it says he cannot offer the bread of his God, means that he cannot do the service of the altar. He cannot offer anything on the altar. For any man who has a defect shall not approach, shall not approach a man blind or lame who has a marred face or any limb too long, a man who has a broken foot or a broken hand, or is a hunchback or a dwarf, or a man who has a defect in his eye, or eczema, or scab, or is a eunuch. No man of the descendants of Aaron the priest who has a defect shall come near to offer the offerings made by fire to the Lord. He has a defect. He shall not come near to offer the bread of his God. He may eat the bread of his God, both the most holy and the holy. Only he shall not go near the veil or approach the altar because he has a defect. Lest he profane my sanctuaries, for I, the Lord, sanctify them. So a person that is a descendant of Aaron, that has any of these physical defects, that has a physical impediment, cannot serve on the altar. He cannot offer the offerings. He cannot go into the holy place. He cannot even go to the Holy of Holies. Why? Because the Lord said so. That doesn't mean they're not priests. They still are priests, and they serve. There was a chamber in the court of the women that was called the chamber of wood. Now there, the priest that had any physical defect would work there, and their job was to visually inspect all the wood that was going to be used for the altar because you have to remember that the altar the fire of the altar is based on the wood and that's where they put the offerings so they would have to be 
inspecting this wood to make sure it didn't have any parasites, it didn't have any worms, because you could not put those things on the altar. That was their job. And if there, there were offerings, because some many offerings, for example, the uh, certain offerings, like the shalamim, which is the peace offering, was shared with the priest. So if this priest had a physical defect, he could still eat uh, what came out of the altar, but he could not offer or put anything on the altar. Okay, He still was regarded as a priest, but his jobs were limited because he had a physical defect. Why? Because the Lord said nothing that has, because we have to remember that the defect represents uh, our bodies, our frail bodies. It, it reminds people of a body that can be corrupt, that's going to die. So therefore, remember that everything that has to do with the temple has to do with life. So even putting a, an offering on the altar is for life. So therefore, a person that had a physical defect was a reminder of uh, corruption of the body, was a reminder of disease, was a reminder of illness, was a reminder that we die. So that's why these priests could not offer or serve the, on the altar. Verse 24, And Moses told it to Aaron and his sons and to all the children of Israel. Chapter 22, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons that they separate themselves from the holy things of the children of Israel, and that they do not profane my holy name by what they dedicate to me. I am the Lord. Now this is explained later in this other uh, paragraph and so the verse say to them whoever of all your descendants throughout your generation who goes near the holy things which the children of Israel dedicate to the Lord while he is he has uncleanliness upon him that person shall be cut off from my presence I am the Lord so what the Lord is saying here the people when they brought offerings that they dedicated to the Lord let's say a, a Thanksgiving offering or a peace offering and the priest received it or ate of it and while he was in a state of virtual impurity, God says you can't do that because you're profaning then the offering that the people are bringing. If you eat something that, you brought, that the people brought and you ate it in a state of virtual impurity, you're basically invalidating that offering. You're making, doing something that you're not supposed to do. Because this is something that the people dedicated to me and I share it with you. You're supposed to eat it in a state of ritual purity. But if you eat it when you're impure, that's a big no-no. And not only that, he says that that, person, that priest shall be cut off from my presence. To be cut off, in the Hebrews, the word karet. Karet. And that means that God has their legal right to have that person die. They can have a premature death. They can die instantly, or they could die without any children, depending on how the Lord decides to deal with that individual. That's the importance of the holiness of the things that the people, that, every, that everything that's put on the altar has a state of holiness, and you have to treat it with respect and with honor because that belongs to the Lord. Verse 4, Whatever man of the descendants of Aaron who is a leper, or has a discharge, shall not eat the holy offerings until he is clean. So he's going to go, remember, these are the things that makes not only the priest, but the people also put them in a state of ritual impurity, a leper, a discharge. And whoever touches anything made unclean by a corpse, or a man who has had an emission of semen, all these things cause ritual impurity. They're not sin. It's just a ritual impurity. It's something that contaminates the sacred space of the Lord. The sacred space is the place that he has put his name on, like the tabernacle, like the temple, like the temple mount, like Jerusalem. That's where his name is. So when you go there, of course, now there's no temple, but the mountain is still there. And even though they have this mosque, the, uh, the Dome of the Rock there, that's defiling the mountain of the Lord. That's defiling the place that he has his name there. Okay, So even though that's there, the mountain is still holy. His name is still there. 
So even though there's no temple, when we go to Israel, we have to respect and honor Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, and everything that's around there because the name of the Lord has been put there forever and ever. And once that temple is back there, we have to follow all these protocols if we go to Israel and we want to go to the Temple Mount and we want to go to the, to the temple itself. Verse 5, or whoever touches any creeping thing by which he would be made unclean or any person by whom he would become unclean, whatever his uncleanness may be, the person who has touched any such thing shall be unclean until evening and shall not eat the holy offerings until, unless he washes his body with water. So these are states of ritual impurity that can be cleansed. You don't have to bring an offering. It can be cleansed by simply doing a mikvah and waiting until sunset, and then you are clean again. Remember why until sunset? Because after sunset, a new day begins in the Hebrew calendar. Okay, so therefore, these types of ritual impurity, you don't have to bring an offering, but you can just do a mikvah and wait until sunset. Now, for example, the leper, there's certain things that the leper, once the leper was cleansed, he had to do, he had to bring certain offerings. So depending on the situation, it was what the person had to do to become ritually pure again. And remember that this purity has to do to allow the either the priesthood, the Levites, or the people of Israel to be in a state where they could approach again the house of the Lord, whether it was the tabernacle or the temple. Okay, so these things really pertain for when the temple is standing. Right now, as I said before, everybody is in a state of ritual impurity because all of us have been close to a dead person. We've all maybe gone to a funeral. We all have maybe walked into a cemetery. So everybody's in a state of ritual impurity. Once the temple is standing, and there's again the, the ashes of the red heifer mixed with water, that's a ceremony for making us again ritually pure so we can go into the temple. When that happens, then we can go back to a state of ritual purity. Because remember that for ritual impurity, ritual has to do with the ceremony and the services associated with the temple. Yeshua died for the moral impurities because for that, there were no offerings. If you committed adultery, the penalty was death. If you were found in idolatry or in witchcraft or in sorcery or divination, the punishment was death. For those things, there was no offering. So Yeshua's death has to do with cleansing us and purifying us, our hearts, our minds, and our conscience from ritual, I mean, from moral impurity. Okay, because for those things, there were no offerings. So that's what Yeshua did. That's why Yeshua died. Okay, and rose again. Because for the other stuff, there were offerings. You just either took a, did a mikvah or brought an offering pertaining to whatever uh, ritual impurity was, and you were cleansed again. You could go back into the temple. You could go up the mountain again. But for moral impurity, if you were caught, you were judged, and the sentence was death. You can say, well, what if I bring 10,000 lambs? Will I be uh, forgiven? No. The penalty was death. So that's why Yeshua, when he resurrected, he did away with death because that was the punishment that was going to separate us from God forever and ever. If those things were not cleansed out of our hearts, if those things were not cleansed out of our minds, okay, because those are things that nobody knows unless they see you doing it, but God the Father knows. You could be committing adultery and nobody knows, but he knows. So according to Torah, the penalty for adultery is death. But through Messiah Yeshua, let's say you repent of your uh, adulterous relationship and you come before the Father and you ask for forgiveness and you really repent, and you go back to your wife or your husband, and you want to put your uh, relationship and your family back together again, you really want to work on that, and you don't want to continue committing that sin, the Lord is going to forgive you, absolutely. 
And Yeshua, because of what he did, is going to cleanse you of that moral impurity. You become cleansed again. You become pure again before the eyes of the Father. But then if you go back to the adultery again and continue doing what you want to, the book of Hebrews says there's no more offerings for that. Because what you're going to do, you're going to trample again the blood of Messiah. You commit adultery, ask for forgiveness, commit adultery, ask for forgiveness, you know, and, and take it. It's not a joke. It's not a game. If you really repent, you don't do that again because you've been purified and cleansed by the blood of Messiah. You just can't say, oh, I'll ask for forgiveness. And no, because right there <laughs> you're doing it intentionally. So what's the purpose? Do it and then ask, oh, the Lord will. No, it's not, it doesn't work that way. So that is why the Lord died, because for the other things, like leprosy, uh, physical discharges, emission of sem semen, touching a dead corpse, all those things, there were offerings for that. Verse 7, and when the sun goes down, he shall be clean, and afterward he may eat the holy offerings, because it is his food. So once the priest is cleansed, they can eat of the offerings that have been brought and are, uh, of which they are allowed to eat. But they have to eat them in a state of ritual purity. Whatever dies naturally was torn by beasts, he shall not eat. To defile him said himself with it, I am the Lord. They shall therefore keep my ordinance, lest they bear sin for it and die thereby. If they profane it, I the Lord sanctify them. So for the priests, doing things in a state of ritual impurity meant death because of the greater holiness that the priesthood has. The greater the holiness, the greater the responsibility, the greater the accountability, the greater the restrictions. You just can't do whatever you want. So for example, like the president, not this president, but anyway, let's say the position of the president of the United States of America. That's a high position. You just can't do, they just can't do whatever they want. Why? Because of what they represent. They represent the whole nation. They represent every single individual on this nation of this nation. So a president that goes out doing all, all things that are immoral or that are completely wrong, what's that going to say about this nation? So that person is restricted. You know that the president just can't go and say, oh, I want to go to Burger King and have a... What follows the president? A whole bunch of... of, 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 of uh, Secret guards and, and, and people, to, you know, they might say, they might, if he goes to a Burger King, they'll probably say, everybody needs to leave until the president goes in, buys his burger, eats it, and leaves. Protection. Okay, so imagine the same thing has to do with the priesthood that serves the Lord because of what they represent. So they have, to, they have more restrictions than the rest of the people. They just can't do whatever they want. Do you remember the sons of Eli? Eli was the high priest during the time of, of Samuel. Remember Samuel when Samuel was brought by his mom to the to the tabernacle? And he, he grew up with Eli. And the sons of Eli were doing all the opposite that it says here about the priest. They were eating the things in ritual impurity. As a matter of fact, there were uh, many of the women that would bring offerings to the tabernacle. They would abuse them sexually. Or they would take the offerings and take the best part of the offerings before they were even put on the on the uh, altar and eat them. They would keep them for themselves, cook them for themselves, and eat it for themselves when it was something that was brought by the people to all be offered in the altar. They were doing such horrible things that through Samuel, God spoke to Eli and he said, Your boys, you're not you're not handling your sons. Because of that, they're going to die. You will not have any more descendants. And we know that the sons of Eli were killed. And then Eli, because of what had happened, he also died suddenly. Okay, because of what they were doing with the things, the holy things of the Lord. If you don't recall that, just read that. I think it's in the book of Samuel. Verse 10. No outsider shall eat the offering. One who dwells, the holy offering, one who dwells with the priest or hired servant shall not eat the holy thing. In other words, when it says outsider or someone who is a hired or dwells with the priest is someone that's temporarily dwelling with them. An outsider that comes in is doing a job and then leaves. It's not part of the, of the household of the priest. 
Anyone that's not a priest cannot eat of the holy things that the Lord has called holy. But at verse 11, but if the priest buys a person with his money, he may eat it. And one who is born in his house may eat his food. In other words, if a priest buys a servant because it's his property, and if children that are born in his house or anyone that's born in his house is part of the household, they can eat of the things that are given to the priest to eat. They can participate of that. If the priest's daughter is married to an outsider, she may not eat of the holy offerings. In other words, she married someone that is not a Jew. But if the priest's daughter is a widow or divorced and has no child and has returned to her father's house, as in her youth, she may eat her father's food, but no outsider shall eat it. And if a man eats the holy offerings unintentionally, then he shall restore a holy offering to the priest and add one-fifth to it. If somebody comes to the house and there's meat, let's say it's the priest's house, and there's meat, and he's hungry, he eats of it, not knowing that that was meat that was brought from the altar, he has to pay for that. He has to restore that that he ate, and not only that, he has to add 20% of the value of that piece of meat. But he did that unintentionally. Okay, remember that is all these offerings are unintentional things that the people do. Verse 15, they shall not profane the holy offerings of the children of Israel, which they offer to the Lord, or allow them to bear the guilt of trespass when they eat their holy offerings. For I, the Lord, sanctify them. So everything that is done in the tabernacle and in the temple, there's restrictions, there's laws pertaining to ritual purity and to holiness and they have to be followed why because this is the house of the lord you just can't do whatever you want in the house of the lord it's his house it's like your house you just can't let anybody from the street come in and do whatever they want even when you have visitors do you allow them let's say uh you're in your home and you have your bedroom you share with your husband and you're just going to let anybody come in and sleep there in your bed and do who knows what in your bed course not so the same way is this with the lord he has restrictions on his sacred space because it has to be maintained sacred and pure and the same thing in verses 17 through 33 it talks about you can't bring an unblemished a blemished offering for example you can't bring sheep or goat or cattle that have physical defects if you don't allow a priest with physical defects to serve, how are you going to allow an animal that has a defect to be put on the altar? Again, why? Because blemishes represent corruption, represent death, and nothing that represents death can be put on the altar. So they remember in uh, Malachi, one of the things that the prophet is complaining, that God is complaining to the people. You bring your blind animals, you bring your lame animals, and you offer them. How would you do would you do that to your governor? Would you give them a gift of an animal that has a defect to your governor? So why do you do it with me? So the same thing, you cannot br you have to bring always the best to the Lord. Now in chapter 23 goes through the feast, what's called the feast of Hashem of the Lord. And remember there's eight feasts total. There's a weekly feast, which is Shabbat, and then you have the annual feast, which are seven. Chapter 23. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, say to them, The feast of the Lord. They are not the feast of the Jews. The feast of the Lord. Why do they say the feast of the Jews? Because the Jews are the ones that have been doing them for over 3,000 years. They are not feasts of the Jews. It's the feast of the Lord which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. These are my feast. It starts with the Sabbath. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest. In Hebrew, that is called a Shabbat Shabbaton. A Sabbath of solemn rest is a Shabbat Shabbaton, a holy convocation. You shall do no work on it. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. In all your dwelling means anywhere you're at, you celebrate Shabbat. The first festival 
is the Passover. That includes the unleavened bread. Remember, this, this is in the month of Aviv or the month of Nisan, the first month of the biblical year. These are the feasts of the Lord, holy convocations, which you shall proclaim at their appointed times. Moedim. Moed means appoint. Appointed times, moedim. They're specific times that the Lord has assigned, that he himself has chosen. It says, on the 14th day of the first month, which is Aviv or Nisan, at twilight is the Lord's Passover, Pesach. And on the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. So remember that the days in the Hebrew calendar start in the evening at sunset. So what is he telling you? On Passover, as the day 14 is finishing, day 14 of Nisan or day 14 of Aviv, as that day is finishing, usually between 2 and 5 p.m., that's the time frame where the Passover lamb was killed, was slaughtered, was offered, okay, during that time frame. And then after the lamb was offered, it was given back to the, the owner. He would put it into the oven. He would roast it. Once it was roasted, he would take it to his house. And they would sit down to eat it. And by the time that happened, we have the 14th finishing. And at sunset, day 15 starts. The 14th is not a Sabbath. The 15th is. So when that 14th is finishing, and you already the 15th is starting, you already have your roasted lamb, you go to your house, you sit down, it's a Shabbat, and you sit down to eat it with unleavened bread, with matzah. That is a Sabbath. That is a Shabbat, day 15. And that same day that you're eating the lamb starts unleavened bread, the festival of unleavened bread for seven days. So from the 15th plus seven days, 21st of Aviv, you are celebrating unleavened bread. It's a, day, it's a whole week. You're eating matzah. Okay. Verse 7. I mean, 6. On the 15th day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the Lord. Seven days you must eat unleavened bread. On the first day, you shall have a holy convocation. That means on the first day, that 15th is a Shabbat. You shall do no customary work on it, but you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord for seven days. The seventh day shall be a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it. So the last day of unleavened bread is also a Shabbat. So the first day, the 15th, and the last day, which is the 21st of Aviv, is also a Shabbat. Now the days in between, you can work. Okay, the days in between... You can work, but the first day and the seventh day is a Shabbat. You have, you have, we have to come together to celebrate it. And during those seven days, if the temple was standing, every seven, every day of those seven days, you had to come and bring an offering to the temple. Okay. Then we have the feast of first fruits, verse nine. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give to you and reap its harvest." Then you shall bring a sheaf of first fruits of your harvest to the priest. That sheaf, another word for that sheaf is an omer. You are going to bring an omer. And remember that in Aviv is already the spring springtime. So the first harvest that you're going to harvest during this time is barley. So the omer or the sheaf that you're bringing is of barley and it's approximately like two liters of grain. So the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He shall wave the sheaf or the omer before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf. On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So remember that that first harvest of barley you have to wave it. Now, the thing is that because now there's no temple, and it was decided by the Sanhedrin that this first fruit, the day of first fruit, is going to be the 16th of Nisan. So the 14th, you slaughter the lamb. The 15th, you eat it, and it starts the unleavened bread festival. And then the 16th is going to be first fruits. Okay? And you are supposed to bring barley to the temple. 
Now, the 15th is a Sabbath, so that's why it says, On the day after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. And you shall offer, in, verse 12, And you shall offer on that day when you wave the sheep, a male lamb of the first year without blemish as a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for sweet aroma, and its drink offering shall be of wine, one-fourth of a hen. So besides bringing the barley, you also have to do other offerings. You bring other things. You shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until the same day that you have brought an offering to your God. In other words, you cannot taste that barley until you first bring your first fruit offering to the Lord. Once you do that, then you can eat all the grain that you want. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. Verse 15, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of a wave offering, seven Sabbath shall be completed. So that means that when that barley is brought and it's waved in the temple, from that moment on, you start counting what's called the 50 days towards Shavuot, which is called the counting of the Omer. Now, they used to, there was two, uh, there was several ideas of when, what Sabbath is the Lord talking about. Some people understood, like the Sadducees, that the Sabbath you started counting towards the Omer was the weekly Sabbath. The Pharisees said that the Sabbath that you start counting, that you used to start counting the Omer is the Sabbath of the first day of unleavened bread, because the first day of unleavened bread is a Shabbat. Now, I used to think before that it was the Sabbath, weekly Sabbath. From that Sabbath, you started counting for the Omer. But when you read it in the Hebrew, it says you, it's, you have to do a complete count of seven weeks. Complete count of seven weeks means that you cannot leave any day out. Therefore, if this is the 15th and it says a Monday, I can't wait to Shabbat to start counting the Omer. Why? Because you're leaving all these other days in between. They are not being counted, so therefore it's not seven complete weeks. So if this is the 15th, it's a Monday, and it's Shabbat because it's the, the first day of unleavened bread, after this day, the next day, which is Tuesday, from Tuesday forward, you start counting the Omer seven weeks or 49 days. Okay, so you won't leave any days in between. Now this year so happened that the Omer started, was started counting on Sunday. Therefore, when we celebrate Shavuot this year, it's also going to be on a Sunday. But you have to come count the seven weeks, the 49 days, right after the Shabbat, that is the first day of unleavened bread. It takes a while to understand that, so don't, don't feel bad if you don't get it yet. Shavuot this year is going to falls on the 16th of May, and the evening of the 16th starts the day 50. Okay, we'll be meeting here for celebration. And it says, the Feast of Weeks, and you shall count for yourselves from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths shall be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Shabbat, then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. This time, the grain that is harvested is the wheat. Wheat is the, what's the harvest that's brought, the grain that is brought. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah. This shall be a fine flour. They shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits to the Lord. This is the only time that an offering with leaven is brought to the temple. The only difference is because it has leaven, this bread, this flour is not put on the altar. The bread is made, it's made with leaven. You eat it, but you never put it on the altar because it has leaven. Remember that leaven represents fermentation, corruption, again, association with death. Leaven is associated with, in this case, and the bread is associated with death because it ferments. It's a sort of corruption. So therefore, the bread are made with leaven, but they're not put on the altar. 
Verse 18, and you shall offer with the bread seven lambs of the first year without blemish, one young bull and two rams. They shall be as a burnt offering to the Lord with their grain offering and their drink offerings and offering made by fire for a sweet aroma to the Lord. So all these festivals have specific offerings that had to be brought to the temple. Then you shall offer one kid of the goats as a, as a purification offering and two male lambs of the first year as an offering of peace, a shalamin. The priest shall wave them with the bread of the first fruits as a wave offering before the Lord with the two lambs. They shall be holy to the Lord for the priest. And you shall proclaim on the same day that it is a holy convocation to you. You shall do no customary work on it. It shall be a statute forever in all your dwellings throughout your generations. So that day of Shavuot is a Shabbat. That means that this year that it's going to start in the evening of the 16th is a Sunday. That is from Sunday evening all the way to Monday evening. That means that Monday you're not supposed to be working. So you might want to talk to your boss about that. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So every time they, they brought a harvest to the temple, they always had to leave some of it in the ground for the poor people. If you remember the story of Ruth, Boaz, because he already had his eye on her, <laughs> when they were gleaning, they would leave some so she would take it and bring it to her mother-in-law, Naomi, so they could have food to eat. Then comes the Feast of Trumpets. Now we're going into what's called the Fall Feast. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, which is the month Tishri. Now you have to remember that you have to use the Hebrew calendar to know these dates. You cannot use the Gregorian calendar because you'll be lost. Okay, you have to use a Hebrew calendar to know these dates. <laughs> On the first day of the month, you shall have a Shabbat rest, a Shabbat Shabbaton. A memorial of blowing trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no customary work on it, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. Not only is it the Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets, or Rosh Hashanah, which the Jews use it as a new year, it is also a new moon. So not only do you have to bring the offerings of Yom Teruah, you also have to bring the offerings for a new moon, because it's the start of a new month, the month of Tishri. Verse 26, and, I, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Also the tenth day of this seventh month shall be the day of atonement, or the day of expiation, or the day of purification. It shall be a holy convocation for you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by the fire to the Lord. So Yom Kippur, this is Yom Kippur, is the only day that the Lord requires that we fast. So we fast from the evening of the 9th all the way to the evening of the 10th. We're fasting completely. It's the only time that the Lord requires fasting. And you shall do no work on that same day, for it is the day of atonement to make atonement for you before the Lord your God. And remember that this is the festival that would make complete cleansing of the whole sacred space. It would be a spiritual cleansing from the Holy of Holies all the way to the outer court. Because in spite of, the, the thing was that it, sometimes people committed, uh, had ritual impurity and they weren't even aware of it. Or they didn't bring the offerings when they were supposed to. So, because all those things were accumulated, contaminated the sacred space once a year, in Yom Kippur, all those ritual impurities were cleansed. It was a cleansing completely of the house of the Lord. Verse 29, for any person who is not afflicted in soul on that same day shall be cut off from his people. So it is a commandment to, to fast that day. And if you don't do it, you are liable for, here it, it says cut off, which means again, karet. The Lord has the legal right to do whatever he wants with you. Now we have to understand that some people cannot fast because of sickness. For example, uh, pregnant women are ex exempted. Children less than 13 years old or 12 years old are exempted. Someone that is sick is exempted from those things. So, But if you intentionally don't fast, 
and you're able to do it, you need to understand that there's consequences to that. And any person who does any work on that same day, that person I will destroy from among his people. You shall do no manner of work. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. It shall be to you a Sabbath of solemn rest, a Shabbat Shabbaton. And you shall afflict your souls, in other words, fast, on the ninth day of the month at evening. From evening to evening you shall celebrate your Sabbath. And this is a full fasting, no water, no food, no nothing. Starting from the evening of the ninth to the evening of the tenth. Okay, usually what we do is that after the, the fasting, we have a light meal, soups, bread, things like that to break the fast. But it's, we're commanded to fast that day unless you have a, a worthy excuse. Feast of Tabernacles or Sukkot, verse 33, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel saying the 15th day of this seven month so do we have all these three feasts the same month the month of tishri which usually for us is either september or october the 15th day of the seven month shall be the feast of tabernacles or sukkot for seven days to the lord on the first day there shall be a holy convocation you shall do no customary work on it for seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire to the lord so these days, all these days, there's offerings that were brought to the temple. On the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation. So in the Feast of Tabernacles, the first day is a Shabbat. The seventh day is not a Shabbat, but it's what's called Hoshana Rabbah, the seventh day of Sukkot. It's called Hoshana Rabbah, and it's the day where there's a ceremony, the ceremony of uh, the water pouring or libation of water. On that day, water was taken from the uh, pool of Siloam and brought and put around the altar. And it's the same day when you read in the Gospel of John that Yeshua takes advantage of that day and he says, whoever is thirsty, come to me and drink because it's about the water libation. So basically on that day, the seventh day of Sukkot is the day that he's telling the people, it's not that water that you need to drink is me because I am the true water of light. So he takes opportunity to speak about who he is and what is his purpose during that day of Hoshana Rabbah, which is called the great day. Now the eighth day is not part of Sukkot, but because it happens right after the seventh day of Sukkot, some people think it's part of it, but it's a separate feast. It's called in the Hebrew, Shemeni Atzeret. Shemeni Atzeret, which means eighth day. And it means that, it means like staying a little bit longer. In other words, right after, because remember, this is the end of all the festivals of the year. So the Lord is kind of telling us, okay, please don't go yet. Just stay a little bit longer. I want to spend a little bit more time with you. So on the eighth day, you shall have a holy convocation. You shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a sacred assembly, and you shall do no customary work on it. These are the feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer an offering made by fire to the Lord, a burnt offering and a grain offering, an offering and drink offerings, everything on its day. Besides the Sabbath of the Lord, which is the Shabbat, the weekly Shabbat, besides your gifts, besides all your vows, and besides all your free will offerings which you give to the Lord. So basically, to the Lord is always about giving to him. Why? Because he has given more than enough to us. And when we come to him, we never come empty-handed. We always come with an offering. And during the time that the temple was standing, there was offerings for everything. For Shabbat, for the festivals, for Thanksgiving. Because you were thankful, because you were healed, because you were happy. You wanted to share with family, with friends. You always had an opportunity to bring an offering to the Lord. Also, on the 15th day of the seventh month, when you have gathered in the fruit of the land, you shall keep the feast of the Lord for seven days. On the first day, there shall be a Sabbath rest, a Shabbat Shalaton, and on the eighth day, a Sabbath rest, Shabbat Shalaton. And you shall take for yourselves on the first day, 
the fruit of beautiful trees, branches of palm trees, the boughs of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before the Lord your God for seven days. This is what's called the lulav. The lulav has all these species because this is a representation of the fruit of the land. It's a representation of the harvest, the last harvest of the year. Because during this time, remember that in spring you brought barley. In the summer you brought the wheat. And now you're going to bring the seven species of the land, which is the grapes, the olives, the dates, the pomegranates, the figs, the flour, and other things. A total of seven species were brought during this time to the temple. Verse 41, you shall keep it as a feast to the Lord for seven days in the year. It shall be a statute forever in your generations. You shall celebrate it in the seventh month. You shall dwell in booth for seven days. All who are native is Israelites shall dwell in booth, that your generations may know that I made the children of Israel dwell in booth when I brought them out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So Moses declared to the children of Israel the feast of the Lord. So in other words, in Sukkot, you have the lulav, which is you wave, which is a representation of all the, uh, the harvest of that year. Plus, you're supposed to live in booth or in tents. Why? Because it's a reminder of how the children of Israel dwelt in the desert. And it's also a reminder to us that this body and everything around us is a temporary dwelling. We're waiting for that eternal dwelling. And when you live in something that's temporary, that can be blown away by the wind, that can be crushed by the snow, whatever, that our true protection is the Lord. He's the one that protects us, that keeps, keeps us safe. So it doesn't matter where you dwell. It is him who is your true dwelling, your true safety. And then in chapter 24, it goes through uh, some orders or some rulings about how to take care of the menorah and also the table of bread, the showbread. And it says in verse 1 of chapter 24, Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Command the children of Israel that they bring to you pure oil of pressed olives for the light to make the lamps burn continually. That's there in Hebrew is ner tamid. Ner tamid, which means that eternal burning, that flame continually burning. Outside the veil of the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting, Aaron shall be in charge of it from the evening until morning before the Lord continually it shall be a statute forever in your generations. So it was the job of the priests to take care of the menorah. They would do that twice a day. In the morning, they will go in and clean the wicks and remove the uh, oil and the things that was and clean the menorah. And then in the evening, they would light it completely. Because you have to remember that some of those wicks, if they, if the, if the heat, if the light went off, the flame, they would have to put flame again on the menorah. Because the light had to always be, the menorah had always had to always be lit in the tabernacle. And so he shall be in charge of the lamps on the pure gold lampstand before the Lord continually. That was the job of the priest. And you shall take fine flour and bake 12 cakes with it. Two-tenths of an ephah shall be in each cake. So the table of the showbread had to have 12 loaves, 12 loaves of bread, fresh bread. You shall set them in two rows, six in a row, on the pure gold table before the Lord. And you shall put pure frankincense on each row that it may be on the bread for memorial, an offering made by fire to the Lord. So the menorah represents the light of the Lord. It represents also the tree of life. It also, the oil represents the Holy Spirit. And then you have the bread. The, red, the bread being 12 loaves represents the 12 tribes of Israel. And it also represents the provision of the Lord for our lives. Every Sabbath he shall set it in order before the Lord continually being taken from the children of Israel by an everlasting covenant. So that bread had to be replaced every Shabbat. Now, the, the tradition says that that bread, even though it was on the table for seven days within the tabernacle and within the temple, that bread always stayed fresh. So when they took the removed the bread seven days later and put in fresh bread, that bread that they took out smelled and tasted like it had been made that day.
And it says, now we go into the issue of the penalty for a blasphemy. Now, what's going to be spoken in these last verses of this chapter has to do is a contrast. A contrast between kedusha, between holiness and something that is not holy, like blasphemy, like mur murder, like stealing. All these things are contrary to holiness. And the bottom line is that when we follow the commandments, that when we follow Torah, that when we follow the protocols of holiness, we are allowing for the divine order of Hashem to reign and rule in the world, and that cancels out chaos. The purpose of following all these things is to cancel out chaos in our lives, to cancel out chaos in our communities. But if we look out that door and we see that things are happening in this world, the, the last thing that there is is order. We see a chaotic world. We see a chaotic nation. We see a lot of things going on in families. We see a lot of things going on around the world. That lets us know that very few people are following Torah, that very few people are following the protocols of holiness, that very few people are, are doing what the Lord has instructed us. So it falls on us as believers in Messiah, as covenant keepers, to teach our children, to teach our young people, to spread out the word of Torah so that we can bring back order into our lives, order into our families, order into our nations. And so it says in verse 10, Now the son of an Israelite woman whose father was an Egyptian went out among the children of Israel, and this Israelite woman's son and a man of Israel fought each other in the camp. Now remember the camp? is a sacred space, supposed to be maintained sacred or holy because if the people are following Torah and the people are following the protocols of holiness to be able to approach the Lord, the whole camp is holy. And the Israelite woman's son blasphemed the name of the Lord and cursed. And so they brought him to Moses. His mother's name was Shelomit, the daughter of Dibri of the tribe of Dan. It's interesting because Dan represents judgment. Then they put him in custody that the mind of the Lord might be shown to them. In other words, what the Lord wanted to do with him. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Take outside the camp him who has cursed. Then let all who heard him lay their hands on his head and let all the congregation stone him. Then you shall speak to the children of Israel saying, Whoever curses his God shall bear his sin. And whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall certainly stone him, the stranger as well as him who is born in the land. When he blasphemes the name of the Lord, he shall be put to death. So this is completely opposite of Kedusha, opposite of holiness. Then he says, whoever kills any man shall surely be put to death. Whoever kills an animal shall make it good, animal for animal. If a man causes disfigurement of his neighbor, as he has done, so shall it be done to him. Now when it says, so, so it shall be done to him, it doesn't mean, what it means really is you're going to pay for that in terms of money. You're going to give a value, an equivalent value in terms of money of the damage that was made. Because usually if, if a guy um, hits you and you lose an eye, it doesn't mean you go to the guy and hit him also so he can lose his eye. It's not that kind of payment. You have to give the person a monetary equal value of the loss. That's why it says fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. As he has caused disfigurement of a man, so shall it be done to him. But it's an equal compensation, an equal value. That meant that that individual, let's say they lost an eye because they got in a fight. They have to go to the judges and the judges have to make a ruling of how much would be the value of that eye, of that individual, depending on his profession, depending on his livelihood. Let's say if he was a doctor and needed his eyes, he's going to lose his livelihood. So the person that caused that damage has to pay an amount equal to that damage. Who knows? He might have to be paying all his life for medical bills or for things. So the thing is, that the person that had a loss was compensated 
in a just, equal manner. Because it's not fair that if somebody, let's say, damages your car, you just bought your car, it's a brand new car, and they say, oh, I can, I'll give you $500 for it. That's injustice. You have to pay back the equal value of what you damaged. Same thing if something happened in the physical. If there was physical damage, you had to pay back the value of that damage in terms of money or an equal compensation. Verse 21, and whoever kills an animal shall restore it, but whoever kills a man shall be put to death. There was no offerings for that. You committed homicide, your penalty was death also. You shall have the same law for the stranger and for the and from one and for a one from your own country, for I am the Lord your God. In other words, that one who was born in Israel and that one who came to be part of Israel. When it means a stranger, it means someone that comes to dwell in Israel who's not a Jew, but is in covenant with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, J and Jacob. You have to follow the same law as the same person that was born in Israel. Then Moses spoke to the children of Israel. And they took outside the camp, the camp him who had cursed and stoned him with stones. So the children of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. And again, remember the purpose of all this is to maintain the sacred space, sacred, holy, because all our actions, all our words, everything that we do, we represent the Lord. And so we have to be mindful not to dishonor his name, not to dishonor his holiness. So that's why all these restrictions. And again, most of this Ritual impurity and ritual purity pertains to the temple. There's no temple now, but once that is established again, these things will come again into being. So with that, we're going to take some uh, time for any questions or comments.